The word ptarmigan is of Scottish origin and applied to various kinds of northern grouse that change plumage in winter for camouflage. The local name is supposed to have started because the ptarmigan showed no fear of the first humans they saw, even walking about the feet of the earliest. I can relate to that passage because I've been within three feet of the little birds in the Bob Marshall wilderness without them showing fear. But we're not talking about birds. Instead, today we want to discuss a wall, the Ptarmigan Wall in Glacier National Park. It's the rock red above the creek cataract in this photo. More specifically, we wish to talk about a tunnel through a wall in Glacier National Park. Ptarmigan Tunnel through the Ptarmigan Wall. Ptarmigan Tunnel might arguably be considered the most widely known trail feature within the park that was voted best hiking park in America. The tunnel was apparently conceived by Glacier's engineer Charles Randells as a means to put a trail directly from Many Glacier, perhaps the premier trail hub in the park, to the spectacularly beautiful Belly River country along the Canadian line. The park engineer proposed his trail and tunnel in 1928, and the three-year project was approved to begin construction in 1929. A trail was carved up the steep tailless slope from Ptarmigan Lake and two long switchbacks, and a platform as a starting point was constructed. An air compressor capable of providing sufficient air for two jackhammers was broken down at trail's end and packed a half dozen trail miles on several mules. Actual tunnel work began on June 27. The contract was let to Ole Westman, whose six-man crew was composed of hard rock miners from Butte and Coeur d'Alene, who drilled holes for five feet into the wall's argillite face, then packed each ten-hole round with 40% gelatin DuPont powder and touched it off. After the South Face Tunnel was well underway, a one and one quarter inch pipe was run from the compressor up and over the top of the ptarmigan wall and an air hose connected to it and dropped to dangle to where the north portal was to exit. There was a thousand feet of nothing below the dangling hose end. Then miners and their jackhammer were lowered on ropes to begin tunnel excavation from the north end. The following sequence of three pictures show before, during, and after the first blast on the north face. Bear with me while projection takes place. Notice the working conditions on that north face are hardly for the faint of heart. In fact, exiting the tunnel and looking down may not exactly be for the faint of heart today. Despite the fact that three years of tunnel and trail construction was completed without serious mishap, Tragedy has stalked the platform outside the North Portal. A few years ago, four riders passed through Ptarmigan Tunnel and paused at the wide spot at the North Portal. A lady stood by the parapet, her horse at her side, while her husband prepared to take a picture. It is thought that her horse may have had a seizure. The truth will never be known. The horse fell against a woman, knocking her over the parapet, then tumbled after it is a thousand feet of free fall to rocks below. With crews working from both sides toward each other, Ptarmigan Tunnel was actually holed out by the end of September. Then it was merely a matter of shaping the 183-foot-long tunnel to six-by-nine dimensions so a horse and rider could plod through, which Randells, the engineer, did on September 30 to the North Portal opening. There it was still a thousand feet straight down with no parapet. Incidentally, this is Randell's wife waiting for the engineer at the South Portal. No ride through for her. Looking out the South Portal of the completed tunnel, Mount Wilbur is in the background. Note the mine car rail still in place for hauling out debris. Then note the same view today with the parapet retaining wall in place and the heavy steel doors erected in 1971 to keep the tunnel from filling with snows during winter blizzards. Faced with looming weather, blasting away rock for the 1,500-foot-long, 8-foot-wide trail along the Ptarmigan Wall's sheer north face wasn't even begun until the following summer. Then it was attacked from both the tunnel and from the Belly River Valley. 
Though that trail was completed in 1930, the parapet retaining wall on both north and south faces wasn't signed off as complete until after the 1931 season. It's interesting in research for this special narrative blog that I read where some of today's hikers appeared horrified that the National Park Service would deface a work of nature such as the arete called the Ptarmigan Wall with an unnatural man-made tunnel. Oddly, nothing is mentioned about the trail to or from the tunnel, or in fact other trails throughout the park. I presume the implication is that the tunnel was a waste of taxpayer money or an abomination or something, but perhaps there are more ways to look at history than by applying today's standards. According to cost analysis spreadsheets actually taken from the three-year project, tunnel construction cost less than $4,000, $3,995.95 to be exact, whereas the cost of massive Trail construction blasting on the North Face came to $16,812.29, and the additional parapet construction came to $6,366.86, making the 183-foot tunnel actually the least expensive portion of this trail. The truth is, without the tunnel and its connecting trails, only a handful of visitors to Glacier National Park, youthful rock climbing enthusiasts, would ever see the magnificent views that can now be witnessed from both portals and the oncoming trails. But remember those who toiled there. A construction camp was set up at the outlet end of Ptarmigan Lake. This is a direct quote from a report issued by Assistant Engineer George Reed. Strong winds tore the tent covering off the blacksmith shop to pieces, and the frequent snowstorms affected the eyesight of the man doing the tool sharpening so that the proper temper was not obtained in the sharpening of the drill steel, which as a result was not as efficient in drilling as the well-tempered steel. He also told how condensed moisture in the air compressor lines would freeze halting operations. I'm indebted to the National Park Service for the construction photos, specifically to Deirdre Shaw, park historian. And I'm indebted to Bill and Mary Lepper and Bill and Cindy Ward, who provided photos of their visits to Ptarmigan Tunnel, including the pics Bill and Mary took of grizzly bears spotted on their way back to the road's end. Be advised that from time to time I'll be doing an audio special on outdoor topics with which Jane and I are most familiar. These specials will be add-ons to our regular Tuesday Campfire Culture blog. Perhaps you'll want to bookmark this site for future reference. And if you find the specials as interesting as Jane and I hope you will, we're trusting you to tell your internet friends. Perhaps send them the link. Again, take a look at the site and bookmark it for your friends. My website is worth visiting, too. That's where you'll find our bookstore with a baker's dozen of Roland's books. That's www.rolandcheek.com. You can listen to his past radio programs as well and visit his weblog archives where you can actually hear a pack of timber wolves on the move. Watch Native Americans using sign language and visit an audio visual of the Bob Marshall Wilderness in art. And finally, you can email me. My address is easy enough to remember. Roland at RolandCheek.com Thank you for listening.